I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> it's probably like getting great 10 sandpaper rubbed on your face every day. I mean, we say it all the time, whether, you know, there's two types of turds, you're a sinker or you're a floater, but you're still a turd, right? I mean, um, we're, we're, we are about players and players playing the plays and not necessarily the plays. Welcome to the Varsity Club Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Joining me this week, Hale Varsity's fearless managing editor, Brandon Vogel. Brandon, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, fearless may not be the word for these next couple of weeks, but um, I am our managing editor. I hope to remain that. It has been a minute since I have had you on the podcast. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, Brandon, and this has nothing to do with Nebraska football, but I sent you a TikTok video and I'm going to guess it was one of the first TikTok videos that you've ever been sent. So I, I feel um, accomplished there, but I sent you a TikTok video earlier this week. And I said, I would like to talk about this hypothetical on the podcast. And the crux of the video is just two guys arguing, I'm assuming on a podcast somewhere else. Um, and, and one guy asks the other, you can get $10 million. You will be given $10 million, but in exchange for $10 million, Every single year, Randy Johnson will nail you with a pitch. He will throw a baseball at you. He will find you, hunt you down, and it can be at any time during the year, and he will throw a baseball at you. And this is, this is the Randy Johnson that blew up a bird with a pitch. Um, $10 million is a lot of money, but there are also like some very real – consequences of making this decision you have had time to sort sort of sit and and digest this hypothetical would you take the 10 million dollars or would you say no i don't want to live in fear for the rest of my life what are you doing here um well first of all not to diminish your accomplishment but aaron regularly sends me tiktok videos um i think because she knows i'm not the target audience for tiktok Um, or maybe she doesn't, but, um, so yeah, I do, I do get, I don't get many, but I've gotten a handful from her previously. What percentage of them, what percentage of them are dog videos? None. Uh, Wow. Yeah. They're, I'm trying to remember any of them off the top of my head. Yeah. I I don't recall any dog videos. Um, our exchange rate is like 95%, uh, dogs. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. See, maybe, maybe because I only have two cats, I get left out of, I get left out of the dog, the dog TikToks. Um, but this was in a, a TikTok that I finally felt like I could engage with. And because I'm very good at taking fun hypotheticals and like bogging them down in details. Um, maybe I'm not good at it. Maybe I'm just incapable of doing anything else. I need to know. I need to know Randy Johnson's does Randy Johnson have a financial incentive involved here as in, okay, so we're taking him, we're putting him at say 28 or 33 years old. He probably hits like 102 to 104 on the radar gun with ease. Um, just a 610 heavy metal drumming string bean of a man who is like built to you. He's got a long lever as they, as they would say. Um, so if there is a year where Randy is like, you know, I, I was really working on the drum fill to Metallica's one this year and I just didn't get around to it. Like, am I free? Is that good? Or do I also, can we, can we stipulate not in the face? If we could stipulate not in the face, I'm more interested. Also, I don't need $10 million a year for the rest of my life. I just no, no, it's, it, just, like, it's just one time. It's just one time. So 10 million is the total price tag. Yeah. As I understood this hypothetical. Oh no, that makes sense. That makes more sense. And also as I understood, I, I interpreted this hypothetical because the, the question that was, that was asked sort of as a follow-up in this TikTok video was, well, what happens when Randy Johnson dies? And the, he doesn't, he's the mortal. answer to that, right. Is it's just Randy Johnson in his prime for the rest of your life. So as I understood that you're getting like a Randy Johnson robot who just wakes up one day a year at any random point in the year. And just like, it's his programmed mission to hunt you out and peg you with a baseball. So 
I, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a day where the robot is just, no, I'm not really feeling it. Well, that answers a lot of my contractual questions. So now I've got to truly value $10 million. Um, it would do a lot. It would be great. I, I don't think I'd take the deal. Like, I don't need that much money to live. It would be nice. But um, yeah, another however many years of just getting drilled by a 98 mile per hour fastball at random moments. Although I do, I do kind of love the idea of just like living every day in fear of being like, is today going to be the day is, is today Randy Johnson day? Um, which should probably be factored in. It would be terrible because it literally would be every day. Like he could get you on December 31st and then he could get you on January 1st. Just to mess with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be, uh, it would be it would be a nightmare. I would yeah. I wouldn't do it either, because like what what if you're sleeping? You just and you just you awaken to a fastball right in the rib cage. Like what happens yeah, you, then? That's the other thing is because you can't prepare. Like it's it's not fun to get hit by a baseball. Period. Doesn't matter like how old you are, how fast the guy's throwing, whatever. Um, but if you're at the plate. And we're not even talking about like body armor here. Like a lot of batters wear now, like you're at least like, you know, you're pretty slim profile, but if you're just going to take a fastball to the chest, like that could kill you. If it, you know, if, if it, all of the stars, quote unquote, (laughs) align. So especially if you're seven, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like this, if this has to happen every single year for the rest of my life, even if, even if it was $10 million a year for the rest of my life, like the joke is like, oh, you don't want to be rich in this economy. So like that factors into it a little bit, but like when I'm like 74 years old, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a healthy 26 year old right now. I don't think I'm going to be a healthy 74 year old, nowhere near the level where I could take a fastball and, and still live. I don't think that's going to happen. So like you're approaching I mean, you get that $10 million paycheck into your bank account, direct deposit at the first of the year. And then you're like, this could be the year. If this is the year, am I happy with what I have accomplished in my life? Yeah. And I mean, when you get to that age, whatever that age may be for you, where you're like, okay, like being a 78 year old who dies by fastball is a pretty (laughs) sweet way to go, but still, you'd have to balance that with like, okay, I got $10 million from Randy Johnson back in 2021. So he could throw a baseball at me once a year. Um, Like you're going to have really eaten that up, that $10 million, that initial payment. Like even if you were smart and, you know, financially responsible retirement, man, it, uh, it, it'll chew into that pretty quick. So you might be like, I only got like $5,000 left. And uh, this is the one, this is the one that kills me. Yeah. There was another, there was another one of these. It wasn't sports related, but it was a hypothetical that was like trending where people were asking their significant others about it. And they're like, would you punch me in the face for a billion dollars? Immediately, immediately. I said, yes, I I showed it to Alex and, and she had the exact same response as me. We were both like immediately, immediately. Yes. A billion dollars. Oh yeah. I'd punch you in the face so hard. And then I showed it to my mom and my mom was like, no, why would I do that? I don't want to hit you in the face. Why would I do that? And I was like, mom, you could buy me a new face. You could literally just <laughs> buy me a new face and be completely fine. She's like, but you'd have to live with the emotional trauma. I was like, then I turn into the winter soldier, you know, all pluses. And I mean, if we're all agreeing to the deal, like if my mom walked up to me and hit me in the face tomorrow, I'd be like, what's that about? If we had pre-agreed to split a billion dollars, I'd be okay with it. I'd get over the emotional trauma quickly. Yeah. Yeah. But to bring it back, the emotional turmoil, I would be just, just puddles of anxiety. If, if I just had to know that like one day I'm going to walk around a street corner, Starbucks cup in hand, and Randy Johnson is going to fire one at me. I don't want any part of that. Yeah. It's like eternally being a swimmer in jaws. Like you're just waiting. You're like, it's out there somewhere. It's coming for me and it won't stop until it has fulfilled its annual duty of drilling me <laughs> with a fastball. Like your body eventually would just be nothing but see marks yep. left over from Randy Johnson. 
wonderful. If there's anybody that is still listening to this, if, <laughs> if, if everybody has not just like logged off and, and started contemplating this hypothetical for themselves, um, let's talk a little bit about Nebraska football. I feel like we should, you know, spring ball and, and whatnot. Um, one of the things that came out this week, uh, ESPN's FPI projections for the new season, preseason FPI projections. And, and I want to start um, with you because you are our resident uh, stats nerd, I say lovingly. Um, Nebraska's projected record by FPI, 5.7 and 6.4, so 500 team. Uh, maybe a coin flip gets you to a bowl game or not. Um, the division win probability, 4.1%. The Big Ten championship probability, 0.8%. So you're saying there's a chance? Uh, and the percent chance to get to six wins was 54.9%. So FPI really views this team as a coin flip team um, with, with a real long shot at even winning its own division. Do you agree with that, Brandon? Yeah, I feel like that's mostly accurate. Um, a 54% chance to get to six wins feels particularly on the nose for, for me. It's, I think it's a little bit of a marker of, of where Nebraska sits currently, because I remember going into the 2017 season, FPI said 5.5 wins for Nebraska. Everyone's like, what are you talking about? They just, they just won nine games a year ago. Da 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 da. And then they went four and eight and Mike Riley and staff are gone. And, and here we are. And then it's kind of been that every year again with FPI, if I'm remembering correctly, where the win total has been pretty modest and Nebraska has had uh, very modest win totals. So you've got to kind of take it at face value a little bit, I think over the past four years, particularly as it pertains to, to Nebraska, but Six and six, it's a three years ago at the start of 2018, certainly, but maybe even at the end. If you would say going into year four at, at Nebraska under this current coaching staff, like it's just get to a bowl game, like that's that's what you have to do. But I think that's I think that's where they're at, and that's basically where FBI puts them. It's interesting, there are some some pretty big divergences in some cases, not with Nebraska, but with other teams between FPI and SP plus, but yeah, I think that, I think six is, is a great starting point for the 2021 Huskers. One thing too, I saw a lot on my timeline, people complaining about FPI and, and yelling about FPI and, and things like that. And I was like, well, I mean, like you could have four, six and six teams and all four of them would feel differently about the way that they're six and six was either constructed or the way that it feels or, or, you know, what they were able to accomplish within those six wins. Um, like for Nebraska, if like, like, let's say they start four and two and then they blow it down the back half of the season, like it's not going to feel the same if they have six wins and they're competitive with Wisconsin and competitive with Ohio state and things like that, people are probably going to feel good. Um, but it's just the fact that like you're in year four with Scott Frost and you look at the percentage chance to win the West, um, which is something that like guys in the defensive secondary have said they want to do this season. And it's, it's a 4.1% chance when, when you, when you look at kind of those numbers and then you think about like, we could have the context of it could be, it could be a, a, a significantly improved Nebraska team that is still six and six. If that is the case, if they are six and six, they get to a bowl game, regardless of what happens in the bowl. Um, they look competitive Let's say they get blown out by Ohio State because everyone gets blown out by Ohio State. No chance to win the division. Is that good enough? Do you think that would be deemed good enough in a year four under Scott Frost? Yeah, probably. And 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 I think that six win mark in the bowl game that would come with it probably is carrying too much weight. Like for the most part, and certainly for where Nebraska wants to be, the bowl game is not a marker of success given where they have been in recent years it absolutely is so you have this kind of weird spot that i think we're in where just play in the postseason like just get there like context does change how good you feel about that season but in terms of like do you feel good do you not feel good just those two options 
if Nebraska gets to a bowl game, I think most people will be like, okay, it seems like things are back on track, at least much more than we've been able to say over the, the first three seasons. So it's, it's a little bit of a strange time for, for Nebraska football. I do think the West is a little bit more wide open potentially than it, than it has been recently. Like Wisconsin is a deserved favorite. They're the top top West team in all of these rankings. And she, like they lost a large chunk of their rushing production and were really a defense led team through a very weird 2020 for them. It was weird for everybody, but particularly for them, Iowa was really, really good last year, like probably overlooked good, I think. And, but they, they have to replace quite a bit. Minnesota returns a lot didn't have such a good season. So it is a, a year where I think a, a Nebraska could jump in there. Uh, a Minnesota, I think, will end up pretty high in my division power rankings um, whenever I decide to to get around to those. Northwestern won't be um, because Northwestern loses almost everything. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is like they still are Northwestern. It's still past Fitzgerald. Like they have those years, like they had two years ago where I think they went three and nine. But they're still going to be a tough out. They're still going to be able to beat anybody on their schedule. And if you don't come in and take care of business, even though it's a down Northwestern team, probably in my opinion, like they can beat you. So it's going to be a really interesting year in the West. Yeah. Northwestern is going to be super interesting to me because like you, you talked about that down year that they had, um, it was either right before or right after they, they went to the big 10 title game. And, um, like it was because their offense was just putrid, but their defense was one of the best in the country. And when you look at this Northwestern team, losing those linebackers is, is it like common sense tells you that that's going to have a very real impact on their defense and their ability to sort of still be that Northwestern team. Because like when you have Patty Fisher, he just kind of sets the tone for the rest of your defense with, with that. So I'm going to be curious if they'll be able to still be, the quote unquote that Northwestern team that just plays clinical um, having to replace those guys. It, it was, and, and I ESPN structures its entire content wheel around what's going on in Nebraska. So I'm not surprised by this, but it was curious timing for these FPI rankings to come out uh, because it sort of like put a little bit of cold water on what was uh, some some growing optimism here in Lincoln. And like, I've said this too, in a, in a couple places so far through these first couple weeks of, of, of spring media and things like that is that I've been encouraged by what I've heard from the coaching staff and from the players. Um, we obviously I haven't gotten to watch anything of substance. So we can't say like, Oh, I'm encouraged by what I see. Um, but like coaches and players were, were saying the right stuff and they were hitting some of the points that were, getting people a little excited, getting people a little optimistic about this upcoming season. Were you getting sort of swept up in sort of what was being said? And then these FBI projections come out and that you're more grounded a little bit, or, or is this, have you just been, I don't want to hear anything. I'm not going to make any judgments on where this team is at until we get to the fall. Yeah. I don't know if I fit neatly into, to kind of either of those camps at the moment, like I, I'm bullish on Nebraska for 2021 um, coming in. And and by bullish, I mean, if I had to set a win total today, I'd probably put it uh, at seven. Like I think they can be a seven win team. And if you are that good, like, you know, that comes with a range too. You might get unlucky and be a six and six team. You might get a little bit lucky and be a, a nine win team. Like I think that's Nebraska's capability at this very early stage here in April um, as we look towards the fall of 2021. So FPI's projection, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's in range. That's a little lower than I would be right now. Um, But I don't think it diminished, you know, anything of what I've, I've heard from the spring. I always am, am pretty skeptical of, of spring talk. A lot of it ends up sounding the same. I mean, I think there's been some, some good moments. Um, you know, you and I have talked off pod about, I think we, and we heard it mentioned this week about kind of the downfield passing game, Nebraska really has to, to make strides there. And that one resonated with me even more than kind of the, the comments about Adrian's Adrian Martinez's accuracy at the moment, which is good. um, But accuracy in kind of what context, because I think last year, 
where he was over 70%, showed, yeah, he can be accurate, but Nebraska basically abandoned any downfield passing attempts. And that's not, that's not going to get it done, I don't think. I don't see Nebraska having that good of a run game to be just like, yeah, we're just going to take 8 to 12-yard chunks in the passing game and be good with it. So, you know, it's, it's always a balance when you're, you're talking about what comes out of the spring. For sure. What's the most interesting thing you've heard so far? Explosive passing game, notwithstanding. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of the, the stuff and, and you know, we, we've had other conversations about not making too much of this, but, you know, and this was credit to you is your question. Um, Greg Austin's early comments about just what they're trying to do to generate some of those, those explosive rushes and, you know, I know it kind of spun out to maybe something even more than it was as that, that quote got out there about, oh, they're going to change up the rushing, the rushing attack. They're going to, you know, they're going to slow down. Like, no, I don't think by the time we get to the season, you're going to really feel like, wow, they really slowed down and it made all the difference. But just the, the fact that they are looking at that is, I don't know if it's a reaction to how the past seasons have gone or if it's a sign of growth that, or just familiarity with the Big Ten of, hey, like pedal to the metal all the time would be awesome, but you've got to be operating at a high level offensively to, to really kind of go tempo for tempo's sake. And Nebraska hasn't been able to do that. And that's not a total surprise. The Big Ten's a tough defensive conference. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm surprised that the offense hasn't had more success than it had has had, at least more consistent success. But – it's um, yeah, it's a little bit of, Hey, this is where we are now, which I guess is becoming a theme of this podcast. Yeah. I, I mean, and you could sort of chalk that up to, like, I don't remember who was saying it. I was reading it on my timeline this morning. Someone who was just pointing out how young this coaching staff was collectively when they got here. Um, you know, they come in and, and they have sort of all of the same wide receiver recruit in the first class for you know, a couple years of being here and they've adjusted that Travis Fisher talked after their first year about adjusting sort of just with the size they needed at defensive back, adjusting some of the things that they've done. I mean, they've had to learn stuff and they've had to um, in, in, in a lot of areas, take their lumps and sort of uh, lick their wounds a little bit. And I, I mean, you know, I'm kind of with you. I, I don't necessarily think that Nebraska is suddenly going to be operating at a Stanford pace when we get to the season. Um, but it, it is interesting. I, I'm right there with you. It, that was that was probably one of the most interesting things that I've heard this this uh, spring period as well. Was just that um, Frost's his biggest sort of identifying feature as a coach is sort of being scaled back a little bit in spring ball, so that they can really kind of drill down on making sure that everything is technical and making sure that everything is fundamentally sound, making sure that guys are finishing through the end of the play. Um, I thought that was interesting, and I'm really curious to see what that what that will translate to when we get to the fall. Like if we could just fast forward through the summer months, which I hate summer weather anyway, I'd be super happy about it. S- same. I am not, a, I am not a summer person. I do not do well being hot, um, cold. I feel like you can, you can take measures against, but exactly. at a certain point, if you're hot, you're hot. Um, yeah, it's uh, the spring game will be interesting. You know, it's, that's always a balance too of, okay, what did we actually see? What do we actually go in hoping to learn and, and what can be gleaned from it? And then you've just got this long kind of, you, you, you sit for the entire months of June and July and things start to wrap or ramp up towards the end of the month, but it's tough. That's uh that's bad news season. Like nothing good happens there. Some teams do get better <laughs> during that stretch, but nobody sees it and they're not talking to anybody. Right. Um, so you can't, you can't even hear about it and decide what to do with it yourself. So I'm all, I'm all for fast forwarding to the fall. Everyone in the summer just tries to not have arrests. It's like, just like the number one thing on a coaching bulletin board is just like, don't have an arrest. Don't get arrested. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> that's my argument. Whenever somebody says, why do you like, winter why do you like cold why do you like snow over like beaches pool sun sitting out and i'm like if i'm cold i can put more clothing on if i'm hot like it's not socially acceptable for you to 
like go the opposite direction. <laughs> so like, there's only so much you can do to cool yourself down. Um, let's play a little game of fact or fiction with the talk that uh, Cam Taylor Britt's cornerback spot is, I don't know, maybe in danger is not going to be given to him is going to have to be earned because there is intense rough as Cam Taylor Britt put it competition uh, at those cornerback spots. Do you think that is fact or do you think that is just a, a nice coach speak kind of talking point for the spring that Cam's job is, is up for grabs still? I would, I would say fiction. Um, that said, I think perhaps more than any other position group, because every, every coach is going to say, every coach in the country, not just in Nebraska, is going to say, is going to tout the value of competition. I will say that Travis, Travis Fisher's room, the, the defensive backs, really seems to live that to a degree that I buy. Um, you know, we heard from two guys who are down the depth chart in that, in that room uh, this week in Farmer and Newsom, and like, I buy it when they're saying it too. I, I think Cam Taylor Britt, even if they were to be like, well, we've got two corners and we can move Cam to nickel, like he's on the field one way or the, the other for me. Um, so I do – the safety spot's a little bit more interesting because I really like some of the guys they have there. And even though they bring back both starting safeties, like it wouldn't surprise me to see a heavier rotation there or even a potentially a new starter there. Um, so, but I think Cam Taylor Britt, I'll be very surprised if he's not a starting quarterback throughout the season, presuming he's healthy. Yeah. I know guys care about this stuff. Um, I know like when you get to the pro level, sometimes, I mean, it, it can, it can factor into salary. It can factor into pay contract, things like that. Um, the more we get to know this defense and sort of understand this defense, the more I, I kind of think that it's, sort of like in basketball where it's not about who starts. It's more important who's on the court for the last five minutes of a close game. Um, like with Nebraska in particular with their defense, it, it's, you know, I mean, yeah, the guys care about starting, but like, like you said with cam, they could move him around all over the place. He's had game experience playing safety. Um, he could probably do some nickel stuff if they wanted to move him over there too. Um, so like to me, it's not, and this is, it's, it's quickly becoming like one of my, uh, lesser favorite things of, of spring is asking about depth chart um, because like they have, so they have, they have cam, they have Deontay Williams and Markel to at safety. And then they've got kind of this like group of five guys behind them that we've heard from Travis Fisher are going to play. And like, I think eight guys for those four secondary spots like, I don't know that it'll necessarily matter who plays the first snap of the game, because I think all eight of those guys we're going to see this season in in varying roles, but still roles. So those those five guys I'm talking about, um, Nadab Joseph, Quentin Newsom, who, who, who we just talked about, Braxton Clark, who's coming off an injury, Noah Pola Gates at safety, and then Miles Farmer, um, who also had an injury last season. What do you make, Brandon, of the discourse around – those guys, the kind of like next five, so to speak, that are in that secondary room. I think they're all to probably very varying degrees, but I think they're all legitimately into discussion. Like Travis Fisher is somebody who, when he says that, I don't feel like he's just saying it. And, and some of that has to do with my own kind of interpretation or evaluation of those guys when they were coming in as recruits. Um, I, I really liked that group and, you're right. I think the the depth chart discussion, now that you think about it, is is almost like a little bit of uh, the intense focus on it um, is a potential sign of trouble. I think because you think about Alabama, um, which I, I'm sure they have depth chart depth chart discussions there as well, and they're interested in who's the the top guy, you know, right side corner or whatever. But when those guys go down in the season, um, as always happens, you nobody worries about what Alabama's going to do next. I think in the secondary, at least, Nebraska has the depth finally, and that's that's what that is. Like you just need the depth to do it. To where 
you're right. You could see, okay, well, maybe it is the three guys returning starters that you'd expect that are out there on the first snap each game. But if a Braxton Clark, well, Braxton Clark might be the other starting corner, so he's not a good example. If Noah is playing a ton of snaps and you notice him, um, effectively there's, there's no difference. And those guys are getting snaps for a reason. Mm -hmm. And Nebraska just hasn't had the depth across the board to be there. And I, I look at the secondary in 2021 as maybe our first real good test of that, of like, okay, it seems like you've got the guys and the talent, like, is it going to show up or is it going to be, well, our four best guys play as much as they possibly can. And if we have to use somebody else, we will, which I think was it Shenander this week that basically said that, you know, at times like you had a, um, a Lamar Jackson, it was like, well, it's him. And then who knows what else? So hopefully he stays healthy. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, like last year, Nebraska had four really good top line guys. And like, I'm, I'm right there with you. The, the point about this being the year where we can finally sort of test that depth because this, I mean, it, you, you are realistically in a situation where, or I guess potentially in a situation where like, if Miles Farmer has two picks in the first half against Northwestern, he can play the second half. And it's, you know, you're playing the hot hand, you're riding the hot hand, so to speak. And, and you can do that. Um, and I think to the, the stuff that shouldn't sort of get lost in the weeds is the talk about how close the DB room is, because when those guys all like each other and when those guys are all able to compete with each other, but also still like really have, a bond with each other, you can get a situation where Deontay Williams looks at miles farmer, have two interceptions in the first half and say, yeah, put that dude on the field. I will watch him and I will cheer him on. And I think that that is also like something that, that Fisher is building in that room as well. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good group for camaraderie. I'm meaning that, the secondary is a good place to have that because while the kind of stereotypical view of, you know, the high profile cornerback might be like, Oh, he's just, you know, he's his own guy. He, he locks his guy down and lets you know about it and is a little bit of a quote unquote prima donna. Like what you really need back there is a group because they literally are the last line of the, def of defense. Um, you need a group that works together. I was writing a, the Maryland preview for Hale Varsity yearbook this week. And, you know, Maryland only played five games last year and, but their past events was insane. And you don't do that without four or five guys, however many guys you have in the secondary working together and being a group that says like, yep, we are badasses and we're going to lock people down and we're going to do it together and we're going to make tackles they didn't have a ton of interceptions, which was bizarre because they were on a rate basis, not pure count because they only had five games, but we're one of the most active secondaries in the country. So I think Nebraska has potential and has the talent back there to be one of those groups. And to your point, it does seem like they have the unity among those guys, even though you've got kind of this clear divide between here's the guys who played a ton and started a bunch of games and here's the next wave. Like, I don't sense that divide when those guys talk. You got the right mix of guys. Yeah. This is that, that was an opportunity for you to plug your take ops statistic. I'm surprised <laughs> that you didn't go that route. Who is for you within that five? So Nadab Joseph, Quentin Newsom, Braxton Clark, Noel Pola Gates, Miles Farmer. You loved Miles Farmer when he was, when he was coming to Lincoln. Um, who, who in that five are you most interested in is it still miles farmer or is somebody else sort of taking that mantle no i think it is still farmer um like you said he was one of my if not my favorite guy in that that class um in the early returns you know the injury was unfortunate and also he you know just didn't play much after that that northwestern game um even pre-injury which was was a bit quizzical to me at least um He's, he's still the guy. I love his athleticism. Um, but Quentin Newsom, you know, Polo Gates was another guy who came out of high school, was was viewed as a really good get. And I think he, he will end up being a really good get for Nebraska. I just haven't seen enough of him to feel like I have a great feel. A, a guy whose name who hasn't come up 
yet in this conversation, but Taman Lyman Lynham seems to be a guy that the coaches really like quite a bit. So just as a kind of a wild card, I'm interested to see if he makes a serious push to kind of be in whatever rotation Nebraska might have. For sure. Another guy to, to sort of uh, keep in the back of, of everyone's mind is Isaac Gifford. We didn't get to see him yeah. when we, when we watched that open practice, but they, they really like him. Um, they've just, I, they've just done a good job of adding talent, whatever ways, whatever, you know, mechanisms they can use to add talent both to this team and, and to that secondary that I think they've done a really good job of it. So um, yeah, when, when the spring game rolls around and we sort of get a look at these quarterbacks, it'll also be interesting to, to get an extended look at the depth of that secondary. Um because, you know, like Nebraska's two backup quarterbacks behind Adrian Martinez are both freshmen and freshmen can be prone to mistakes. And so I'd be curious if maybe they force a couple of things as they are competing for a job and, and we get to see sort of this secondary um, take advantage. Because you, you mentioned they didn't they only had five interceptions last season. Um, I don't have the number directly in front of me, but they had like 20 plus uh, passes defended, pass deflections. Um, so just. Fisher wants them to pick more of those off. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, Brandon, you've probably got work to do, so I'll, I'll let you get back to it. Thank you for coming on the podcast. It was nice to chat with you. Yeah, thank you. We will be back next week with another one. In the meantime, keep reading HailVarsity.com. Make sure you are subscribed to Hail Varsity. Brandon teased the Hail Varsity yearbook. It is coming. It is on the horizon. It's going to be awesome. Subscribe to all of the podcasts. We are a proud part of the Herd App Media Network. Um, we've got the Straight Up Breakdown podcast with Greg Smith. We've got the Mind Your Own podcast with Aaron Sorensen and our producer, Sasha Durkin. And uh, Brandon's podcast, the ID Preview podcast, which you can still subscribe to. We'll be coming back for another season uh, here soon. So keep reading HailVarsity.com. Subscribe to everything. Follow us on all the social stuff. You can get Hail Varsity everywhere. We'll be back next week. Hoda Media Production.